Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for coming. Welcome to CSIS. For those of you who uh, are new to the new center here, uh, welcome to the new world headquarters of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS, um, and I'm honored to be presiding over this panel. Um, as you know from the invitation and from the event, this is a two-hour panel uh, entitled The Syrian Conflicts Foreign Fighters, Concerns at Home and Abroad. Um, I'm honored to have uh, three distinguished guests, uh, deep experts and practitioners uh, who've been looking at the issue of the return of foreign fighters. And what we're going to spend this first hour of the conference on is a discussion about the, the nature of the problem and how it impacts our work. Let me start first by thanking uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the Department of Homeland Security for their support. They've been helping to organize and to drive this conference. Um, it's an issue of deep interest and import to both uh, the Dutch and American governments, and so we want to thank them for their support uh, and their visit. There's no question Syria has become a cauldron of conflict. Uh, the humanitarian atrocities and refugee problems are plain, well known to all of us. The regional instability created by that conflict is unfolding. And certainly we've seen a rejuvenation and rise of violent extremist groups uh, to include foreign fighter pipelines, which is the topic of discussion. We've seen now the flow of thousands of fighters into the conflict from around the world. And now a great and growing concern echoed publicly by American and European officials of the return of foreign fighters into the West. Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson has called the Syrian conflict now a homeland security issue. FBI Director Jim Comey has talked about his concerns over the foreign fighter flow. Uh, and the Dutch and other governments have spoken publicly about their concerns. And so today we're going to discuss what this means for uh, the West, uh, what this means in terms of radicalization, what this means in terms of training uh, of foreign fighters, what this means in terms of the overall network of these groups uh, as motivated individuals return to the West. And I can't imagine, frankly, a better panel than this to discuss these issues. And so what we'll do is um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, ask them to make opening remarks, and then open this up for a broader discussion. And when we do, I will ask uh, those in the audience who want to ask questions uh, to raise their hand. We'll have microphones. Uh, we ask that you stand and identify yourself and then ask a question, uh, and I will moderate that. But let me start first uh, with Dick Schuf, uh, who is the National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. In many ways, the strategic hub of how the Netherlands not only thinks, but also deals with counterterrorism and security issues. He's held numerous uh, high-level positions within the Dutch government, um, particularly Director General for Public Safety and Security in the Ministry of the Interior, he was also the Director of Immigration and Naturalization uh, Service, uh, among other duties. And so he has not only core responsibility, but deep expertise in these issues. To his left is my very good friend, um, Ambassador uh, and Secretary uh, Frank Taylor, who is now the Undersecretary of Homeland Security for Intelligence and Analysis. In that job for about six weeks now, Frank? Uh, but Frank is not new to these issues. In fact, I uh, can't imagine a better person to be in that position. Uh, former uh, State Department Ambassador at Large for Counterterrorism, former Assistant Secretary of Diplomatic Security, um, and former member of the President's uh, Civil Liberties and Oversight Board, among other uh, distinguished positions over a 35-year career. And to his left is Andrew McCabe. Uh, Andy is also a, a close friend. Uh, a distinguished public servant, uh, and comes to us from the FBI. Andy is currently the Executive Assistant Director of the FBI's National Security Branch. Uh, he was most recently, before that, the Assistant Director of the Counterterrorism Division, uh, a long-standing and um, deep reputation for expertise in terrorism out of the New York Division uh, of the FBI. And I will say the first director of the High Value Interrogation Group uh, set up uh, by the U.S. government to deal with high-level uh, 
interrogations and terrorist suspects. So we have uh, the best uh, panel I can imagine on these issues. And what I'd like to do now is turn to Dick uh, and ask him for his opening uh, remarks. Dick. Thank you. Uh, and really appreciate uh, being here. And I, I want to thank the institution that uh, I'm uh, able to, uh, to present some views on the uh, foreign terrorist fighter issue. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the, the foreign fighter issue in itself is not new, but Syria gave it a whole new dimension. Um, and this new dimension, uh, what I'm convinced of, is that it uh, will lead to a, a sustained threat uh, uh, in the next coming years. Um, and as we maybe have thought for a year ago, two years ago, that it will slowly go away, but it will not. And this new dimension is also facilitated by the fact that it are a lot of non-Syrians going over to Syria, which is a big difference, for example, with the Somalia. And arriving in Syria, uh, they end up uh, with UN-listed terrorist organizations affiliated to Al-Qaeda, in particular uh, to Al-Nusra and ISIL. Um, having said so, I, I want to uh, raise a few points about the Dutch approach, uh, a few Dutch figures, uh, but not so much, um, and uh, also from a European perspective, because as you can imagine, in Europe we work very closely together on all levels. Um, and, and roughly have the same policy, although there are some slight changes in the way we try to uh, 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 conquer this problem. Um, the Dutch, uh, we like to say that we uh, work on a comprehensive approach, and this comprehensive approach um, goes along with the fact that we believe that a terrorist, becoming a terrorist is a process rather than a phenomenon in itself. That we need to have a combination of preventive and repressive measures that we have close cooperation, need to have close cooperation between security organizations, intelligence, police, prosecution, but also local communities, local authorities, et cetera, et cetera. And that we need to connect local, national, and international dimension of this terrorist, foreign terrorist fighter. That is really very important. A few figures. I think in Europe we now speak about two to 3,000 people going over to Syria, of what we know of. Um, most foreign fighters have departed with the intention to join these Al-Qaeda affiliate organizations. It is not human aid. I cannot stress that enough. The major waves of departures were end 2012, 2013, but it's still going on. Not in big numbers, but it's still going on. Um, in the Netherlands, so far, about 125 went over to Syria. Um, several foreign terrorist fighters have died in combat. Uh, in the Netherlands, around 12. Predominantly, they are male, but a growing number of female are now traveling abroad. Some are Dutch converted Muslims, and as I said before, most of them are non-Syrian, in the Dutch case, mostly from a Moroccan origin, and have double nationalities, double passports. And they radicalize before they go, and they radicalize even further when they are there, and they experience a great uh, 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 in, in this conflict zone, uh, a lot of violence, and act with a lot of violence as well. And the way they radicalize um, is in a way that they alienate from everybody. They alienate from their parents, they alienate from their friends, unless their friends go along. It's a kind of cult. And they alienate from mainstream uh, Muslim communities, they alienate from the mosque, they alienate really from everybody. And that's important when you try to reach out and talk about the radicalization process in itself. Countering foreign terrorist fighters, we try to, to see it in four changes and challenges. Uh, first of all, violent extremism, trying to prevent people from becoming violent extremists and from becoming willing to travel abroad. Of course, you look in the recruitment and facilitation process, but the recruitment and facilitation process is quite different than we used to see. There is no clear recruitment, uh, risk facilitation, and of course it's very easy to travel abroad uh, and to travel to Syria. And the fact that there's no real recruitment has probably something to do with the radicalization process and the way these groups organize themselves as a kind of network, um, and we used to say as a kind of swarm of bees. Um, of course, we try to prevent them from traveling, but that's rather difficult, because how do you prove that they intend to go over to Syria uh, to fight and to become a terrorist. And of course, the real threat is in their return, not in the traveling away, not going to Syria, but in their return. And the threat, you might say, is threesome. They may become a loner, 
either inspired, maybe disillusioned, uh, maybe traumatized, and pick, take up a weapon and shoot with any possible mean. Um, the group of friends we traveled abroad or became friends, maybe come, coming back inspired by the Al-Qaeda thought, organized themselves, not organized from the Al-Qaeda affiliates, but inspired to create an attack. And of course, the biggest risk, you might say, is uh, uh, organized and sent by the Al-Qaeda affiliates on a mission to Europe. Because let's be, sure, let be frank, it's not a real Dutch problem, not with our borders. Uh, we do, almost don't have borders in Europe. We are almost border free, so the attack can happen anywhere. But at the same time, not everybody is, is returning as a terrorist. So some of them pose a threat after their return. And that was also the reason, uh, as a national coordinator, I had to raise the threat levels of the Netherlands just a few days after I, uh, after I took this post as national coordinator to the threat level substantial, which is the, uh, we got only one left, and that's when we know of an immediate attack taking place in a few days. What we try to do is to, to work on a very focused basis, because we know that the groups of people traveling over to Syria are geographically very uh, uh, focused as well in three parts of the, uh, of the Netherlands. So we try to work very closely with those organizations, those Muslim communities, those local authorities, in trying to prevent travel and to get information from the people when they return. We also try to work on a fairly tailored approach, on an individual approach, on uh, trying to stop them when leaving, but also when returning, a tailored approach. Sometimes very repressive, but sometimes somebody is not a real threat to that society and then we need to give them some help so they will not alienate any further and uh, returning in the Netherlands and the way we try to deal with them makes them a potential terrorist by the way we are trying uh, uh, are treating them. Um, one of the messages we took is, uh, uh, is, is what is important for us as well as administrative measures. Um, we are now discussing uh, changing the law in which we can uh, uh, create a law of Dutch nationality, uh, only in case when there is a double nationality, actually, uh, because of uh, 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 fighting abroad in a terrorist organization, which is not possible yet. Uh, uh, leave loss of Dutch nationality can only be the case if you're fighting with a foreign power. Uh, cancellation of Dutch passports, which we are very active in. And we took away about 25 passports. Termination of benefit payments and allowances, asset freezing, and revocation of residence permits. At the same time, we prosecute and try to prosecute. But probably all you're aware is uh, trying to, uh, uh, um, to get the evidence uh, on terrorism is very difficult. And what they are doing in Syria is also very difficult, also for intelligence organizations, to, not to comprehend, but to gather the right information so they can prosecute in the Netherlands. But at the same time, we can prosecute them sometimes for criminal facts. And that puts them away, and that works. So that's important as well. And of course, look into recruitment, although I said that recruitment is not in the way it used to be. And we are looking for training for terrorism. Radicalization, um, as, as we discussed uh, earlier, and as you mentioned in your introduction, is key in trying to get a grip on uh, the foreign terrorist fighter because they are radicalized before they travel and they radicalize even further when they are over there. What we have seen in the Netherlands is that the, the radicalization, radicalization um, was more or less in control the last years. But the, the new Syria uh, development and the foreign fighter issue, the glorifying of the foreign fighter, the martyrdom of those who die in Syria, the way they talk in social media about what they are doing over there, creates uh, a new injection to uh, sort of rejuvenating of the radicalization process. So radicalization is again high on our agenda. And our intelligence service, together with my organization, is releasing uh, uh, shortly a report on the Dutch radicalization process in which we see the numbers of radicalization growing. And therefore, a new breeding ground for new people wanting to traveling to Syria. So we're trying to reach out again to the local communities, the local Muslim communities, the local mosque, in trying to work together with them in a counter-narrative, in a de-radicalization way, and trying to reach out in preventing the people from really radicalizing. And therefore, a multidisciplinary approach 
is really very important. Prevention and uh, repression, both. The challenges that lay ahead uh, for us are, are, are strategic communication, you might say, building bridges. On one hand, zero tolerance toward violent extremism, but on the other hand, reaching out to the communities, because this is not a religious question. It's about violent extremism. Safeguarding the balance between preventive and repressive measures, and of course, the role of social media on the radicalization process and in what way we can intervene and try to prevent the social media play that role in the radicalization as well. And one last remark, um, maybe you would not expect it from a, a, a coordinator on counterterrorism, uh, that we not, should not lose sight that all measures taken to prevent or suppress terrorist crimes have to be taken with respect to the rule of law and democratic values, human rights and fundamental freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Actually, something we would expect from. <laughs> well, you never know. Counter terrorism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just, uh, we've got a packed house and very happy about that. If uh, there are folks in the back that need a seat, there are five seats up front here. Welcome to come up. Don't be shy. Uh, Frank, over to you. Thank you, Juan. And uh, again, it's uh, great to be back uh, in government service again uh, and working in DHS. Uh, Dick has already uh, done, I think, an excellent job of framing the issue, uh, and it's not just a Dutch issue, issue it's a global issue. Um, why is Syria so important uh, to our Department of uh, Homeland Security? Our Secretary, in his first public speech uh, about Homeland Security, mentioned the, uh, the threat from Syria as a Homeland Security uh, threat. And, uh, for many of the same reasons that uh, Dick has outlined in the Netherlands, we have Americans uh, who are volunteering to uh, go to Syria to fight, uh, some for humanitarian reasons, other, others to join Al-Qaeda after uh, being radicalized, and all of them have the right to return home. Uh, and when they return home to the U.S. or return home to um, places in Europe and um, Asia, it's not just Europe, it's Australia, it's, it's other places around the world. Um, we have no understanding of what they may or may not do, what they may or may not have learned while they were there, and therefore what their plans may be. We also know that al-Nusra and uh, ISIL continue to uh, move the uh, al-Qaeda uh, ideology forward in attacking the West attacking the U.S. is still a very big part of their, uh, their plans uh, that they want to execute. And uh, how these people may play into those plans becomes a matter of uh, uh, concern for the security of the homeland. Uh, and therefore, uh, we work very closely with our foreign partners, uh, our partners within the U.S., uh, to try to better understand and frame the threat. Uh, the point that Dick made about you know the challenge of privacy, civil liberties, the American Bill of Rights are all issues that we are all concerned with as we try to shape and understand this problem. Nonetheless, we have to understand that radicalization is occurring. People are getting uh, training that could uh, potentially result in um, uh, threats to the U.S. homeland, threats to uh, uh, our partners in Europe and other places around the world. And our focus has been a coordinated effort around, uh, across U.S. government to attempt to address where are they training, what are they being trained on, uh, where are they departing from, where are they coming back to our partners in Europe or coming back to the U.S., working with our colleagues in the FBI, and I know Andy will talk a little bit, uh, we'll talk extensively about the FBI's uh, efforts in this area to try to better understand the phenomenon to allow us to, when appropriate, interdict uh, to prevent uh, an act of terrorism from occurring here in the U.S., uh, in Europe, or uh, more broadly to uh, prevent the radicalization that occurs that uh, encourages young men, and in certain cases, young women, uh, to go volunteer, to go to um, that part of the world to uh, 
learn new tactics, techniques, and procedures that can be then turned against uh, uh, their home countries. Um, countering violent extremism is a huge part of how we approach that uh, in homeland security, talking to communities here in the U.S. To, so that they better understand the radicalization process and spot these issues before they become problems uh, as we've done uh, in the uh, Somali diaspora. We're doing it with the Syrian diaspora and other uh, groups that are here who have, uh, who, whose member, members of whose groups have uh, uh, <coughs> volunteered to, uh, to go and fight uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, we believe very strongly that this is a global, international problem, not just a U.S. problem, and that the coordination and cooperation with our international partners is key in sharing tactics, techniques, procedures, understanding travel patterns, and all the other things that allow us to use the tools that we have uh, defensively to protect our aircraft, our uh, and the transit of uh, potential dangerous people across our borders uh, uh, for interdiction purposes. So uh, Dick has really, uh, I think, outlined the, uh, the nature of the issues that uh, concern us as uh, it does the, the Netherlands and some of the tools that uh, we would use in concert with our U.S. partners to try to attack that and also with our foreign partners uh, uh, in trying to attack this phenomenon, which again is a global phenomenon. It's not just Europeans and Americans. It's a global issue uh, involving citizens from many countries around the world. I look forward to the discussion uh, in depth on those issues going forward. Thank you, Frank. Andy, with your indulgence, uh, you know, we have such popular demand for uh, this conference. We're going to actually lift uh, this wall and add additional seats. Andy, I think it's your presence that may have added a few more bodies in the audience. So if that's okay, we're going to raise this. We're going to demonstrate the utility of the new CSIS headquarters. And for those of you who are near, uh, watch your hands and feet. Keep them inside at all times. So give us just a two-minute hiatus. We'll lift it, and uh, then we'll proceed. We know you're just showing off. That's okay. <laughs> Let's hope it works. I check. One, two, three. My check.
All right. Uh, like the retractable roofs of the uh, major stadiums around the world, uh, we've achieved uh, our goal here. Andy, thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so in the uh, Hoover Building, we have walls that are liable to fall down, uh, <laughs> but we don't have any that will go up automatically. Um, well, good morning, and, and thank you, Juan. Thank you to the Center for Strategic and International Studies for having me here today. Uh, it's an honor to address this group uh, and to hopefully provide some insights as to how we at the FBI see the uh, current CT threat and specifically the, is the issues emanating from uh, developments in Syria. I'd first like to say thank you to my fellow panelists and, and uh, that I concur with uh, their remarks and, uh, and uh, certainly the laydown of the threat. I will try to um, keep my remarks brief. I know you all have many questions and we're anxious to get to those. But just to give you a little bit of context to see how, we, how Syria fits in with the overall CT uh, picture that we've been, as you know, challenged with for many years. The threat generally uh, from our terrorist actors uh, if you could characterize it in one word, it is fractured. Uh, it is far more complex. Uh, it is more diverse uh, than the threats we have seen on the CT side, uh, let's say, four, five, six years ago. It is more diverse ideologically, it's more diverse geographically, and it's more diverse tactically. Nevertheless, we see some enduring issues uh, that will be, I'm sure, you'll all be familiar with each one of them. And, and these are some of the issues that we've been focused on over the last several years. Of course, there is uh, Al-Qaeda core, or AQ core, as we like to refer to them. Uh, diminished, but not removed. Um, AQ core, we believe, continues to present a persistent threat to the United States. There's persistent interest and in planning uh, and intent on, beha on the behalf of the still very capable uh, men affiliated with Al-Qaeda core, and that is an intent to hit us here in the homeland. That is something that causes us great concern every day. At the same time, they've been incredibly effective at developing their network of affiliates. Those affiliates are greater in number than they were years ago, and they're also greater in capability. Uh, the most widely known, and of course, um, we believe most lethal and most effective of those affiliates is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you're all familiar with the 2009 Christmas Day uh, attempted attack, the printer bomb plot in 2010, and then of course the follow-on um, follow plot that we refer to as kind of underwear two, for lack of a better, uh, better term. AQAP continues to thrive in its safe havens in, the, uh, in, in Yemen, um, and again, I think you have to put them in the same category as presenting a persistent and competent threat to the United States. Uh, in addition to AQ Core and the affiliates, uh, one of the issues we've been focused on uh, intently over the last several years are activities presented by our own homegrown violent extremists. Uh, these make up the majority of the arrests that you've seen and heard about in the media over the last few years, the disruptions we've been able to affect here in the homeland. HVEs are tough. They are hard to find by nature. They're individuals who operate many times alone they don't rely on networks. They maybe um, uh, operate individually as they proceed down that pathway of radicalization towards mobilization. They are, for that very reason, hard to find. They are hard to cover with traditional kind of standard investigative techniques. They are, as a population, increasingly aware of our traditional FBI approaches and techniques, so they challenge us to constantly stay one step ahead and to remain kind of creative in our approach uh, to disrupting their activities. And they are undisputably impacted by the significance of online propaganda. Um, as we've seen an explosion in communication capability and techniques, everything from social media to online forums, uh, there is really no limit to what anyone can encounter on the internet, and we find that the ready access of very effective, very professional, professionally produced uh, propaganda that speaks directly to our Western-based uh, homegrown violent extremists, uh, there's no question we see an impact uh, that that propaganda has on that population. So if you look at those issues that have caused us great concern over the last several years, Syria is truly unique. 
because it combines each one of those issues in one or more ways. Uh, there is no question that Syria is a place of significance for AQ Corps. Um, some of the actors and groups and training locations that cause us greatest concern, uh, we believe, uh, in Syria are impacted in some way by the planning, intent, or possibly presence of, uh, of individuals affiliated with AQ uh, and its core group. Uh, on the affiliate front, I mean, uh, there are probably, after AQAP, probably two of the most notorious and effective right now Al-Qaeda affiliates are the Islamic State uh, of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, and al-Nusra Front, many times who seem to be battling each other for supremacy uh, in that uh, hotly contested area, but nevertheless, two large, effective uh, AQ affiliates with uh, clear experience on the battlefield, tactical experience, and both, as uh, General Taylor has mentioned, both with clear intent uh, to target us here in the homeland. And Syria is no less significant to our homegrown violent extremist population. It is, in fact, a commonality that we see among many of our uh, homegrown violent extremist subjects of investigation. Many of them are motivated by and inspired by the activities that they see uh, taking place in Syria. Many of them intend to travel to Syria to affiliate with groups like ISIL or on Nusra Front and to participate in that jihad. In fact, travel to Syria, we feel, has become by far the most significant uh, driver of, uh, of extremist intent and activity here in the United States. It's had uh, uh, as our director has mentioned in, in, several, uh, in several speeches recently, uh, we see Syria impacting the global jihad in a way uh, far beyond the way maybe Bosnia did in the 90s or Afghanistan after that. There may be many different reasons for that, and we can probably talk about those later in the program. But nevertheless, Syria remains a significant destination for our homegrown violent extremist population. And finally, of course, propaganda. I mean, much of the reason why our HVEs, as we refer to them, are interested in traveling to Syria is because of the glorification of that process that they see and participate in with the propaganda they devour uh, online. So the question for us is, of course, what do we do about it? Um, and really, to go back to my kind of opening, if I could sum it up in one word, that word would be partnerships. This is truly a global crisis. It is a global issue, and it's one that's far beyond uh, the abilities of any one of our organizations or any one of our nations to address individually. Um, we begin that working with our closest partners first. So here at the FBI, we, we've worked and continue to work incredibly closely with our partners in the intelligence community and at the federal level uh, here in the United States. Uh, General Taylor and I have had the, um, had the unique opportunity of building a special team of analysts and agents who are now co-located and working on this problem set exclusively, uh, working kind of shoulder to shoulder together each day uh, in an effort to, con to continually develop, to <coughs> continually identify persons of interest to us who may have traveled to Syria and have now returned to the United States or who intend to travel to Syria uh, for those purposes and of course to develop strategies of how uh, we'll address those potential threats. We're also working very closely with our domestic law enforcement partners, um, our state and local partners, our tribal partners, those folks, you know, I am constantly trying to get out the message. In fact, the general and I were in San Francisco speaking to a gathering of major city chiefs just two days ago. We are constantly trying to send the message that um, individuals of interest to us, folks who we may ultimately be concerned with along the HVE lines, are likely to come to the attention of local law enforcement first. And our ability to hear about those encounters and to get those uh, sus uh, suspicious incidents reported back to our JTTFs around the country is going to be a key factor in our ability to stay ahead of these developing threats. Um, the next step in that partnership uh, circle is, of course, community outreach. Um, opening lines of communication, opening lines of awareness with our key communities uh, around the country we think is going to be essential to staying ahead of, uh, of this issue. Uh, we had some success 
uh, in doing that with our efforts to address uh, the travel of folks to Somalia to affiliate with Al-Shabaab back in 2006, 2007, 2008. Uh, but quite frankly, this issue is more challenging. Um, there isn't a single easily identifiable community from which our Syria travelers all uh, spring from. They are a very diverse group. They span the range of uh, religious backgrounds, of socioeconomic background, of educational background. They are of both genders. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they, when you put them all together, they look like America. It's a widely diverse group of folks of all ages and all backgrounds. So it's um, our outreach efforts will be challenged uh, in that respect. And finally, of course, working very closely with our foreign partners. Uh, the robust exchange of intelligence and information about our subjects of investigation is going to be essential to staying kind of on the front edge of this issue rather than trying to catch up with it. So that I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Thank you, Andy. Wonderfully insightful comments from all three panelists. Uh, let me take the prerogative and ask just a couple of introductory questions and, and ask the panelists to address them, and then we'll open it up to the audience. And uh, Dr. Alterman, with your indulgence, I'll take a couple of minutes of uh, injury time because of the wall. Thank you. Um, first thing I want to ask, in part to give the audience a picture of what you're seeing, is to talk a little bit about the geography of what's happening, the, the routes that the foreign fighters are taking in and out, and what that means for the geography of the landscape. Andy, you talked a little bit about that in terms of the communities. There isn't a central locus like uh, with the Somali community where you worried about Minneapolis or Columbus or Seattle where the, the concentration of, of radicalized individuals resided. Um, so can you talk, can all of you talk about sort of the geography of this and how that impacts what's happening? Because I think also from a European perspective, one of the challenges is Syria is a lot closer than Afghanistan. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get in and out of Turkey, for example, than it was um, uh, Syria in the Iraq context. And so can we talk and give the audience and, and those watching online a, a vision of how you see the geography and how that impacts uh, the way you look at the problem? Dick? I'll see if I understand the, uh, the, the question well enough. Uh, uh, I think I, I'm used to English, but if I understand it just a little bit wrong, then please help me. Um, first of all, the geography of the, where, where, I already said it, the non-Syrians, in the Dutch case, are mostly Moroccan, some Turks, uh, and, and some Dutch converts. In Belgium, it's roughly the same. Um, in France, it's a little bit different. In the UK, it's all kind of uh, uh, nationals. In Germany, it, it's more Turkish, and it has something to do with the flow of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the laborers in the, in the 60s, which went over. Um, and uh, um, it, it is not part of a big asylum stream. It's maybe important to speak as well. Um, when they travel abroad, now I must first do another geographical question. We see again, um, as I mentioned, I think in my introduction as well, uh, a few hotspots in the Netherlands. Uh, where the radicalization process is taking place, where there are old friends, old groups related somehow to the old homegrown terrorist networks we used to see, say, a decade ago. Uh, not very clear, but it, it's there. Uh, so it's focused as well. Uh, and, and, and I'm not quite sure how in the other European countries, although in Belgium we see roughly the same. In, in, uh, I think in, in a few weeks' time we have a, a meeting with uh, some Dutch mayors and some Belgian mayors of the cities where this particularly occurs. Um, and then you, you spoke about the route, that's very clear, they all went through Turkey. No question. Uh, and of course we have a lot of contact on the European side, but also bilateral with the Turkish, to see how we can, uh, on the border, uh, get the information, get the information exchange, um, and what, what we can do in preventing them from travel, and what the Turkish can do to prevent them from traveling, or let them know that they are returning. Did I understand the question right? Perfectly. All right. <laughs> Even better than I imagined. <laughs> I'm uh, going to uh, turn to my colleague Andy to talk specifically about, uh, to follow on some of the things he's talked about already. I, I think for DHS, um, this is a CVE problem. And so it's every community uh, across our country. It's not just. Uh, as with the Somali community in, um, in Minnesota. Um, we, 
because of the nature of who the Bureau and others are seeing getting involved, we're doing an outreach across the country uh, using our uh, countering violent and extremist outreach into communities uh, and into uh, not just uh, Muslim communities but broader communities so that they understand this phenomenon. You know, part of our approach to this, as with the Bureau, is uh, community awareness, local law enforcement awareness, a phenomenon that uh, could contribute to uh, future extremism is a very, very important part uh, for us. So in this particular phenomenon, it's, it's across the U.S. and raising awareness of the potential issue so that communities can help us in spotting potential problems that uh, can be addressed either socially or through law enforcement efforts and those sorts of things. Sure. So completely uh, uh, concur with uh, General Taylor's comments. I, I think that um, a couple a couple of things maybe are, are relevant to your question. First, uh, Juan, we're not seeing, there isn't a clear, one clear kind of jump off point from the United States to travel uh, over to Syria. Um, and it, as the general mentioned, the population is so diverse. If you look at some of, even just in the last few months, we've had disruptions of individuals who were attempting to travel to Syria for the purpose of affiliating with designated terrorist groups. Um, and we've made arrests of individuals in Sacramento, California, in Chicago, Illinois, in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, in Detroit, Michigan. So it's, it spans uh, the country. One of the challenges of, of kind of getting your hands around the issue is that, of course, it is not it's not illegal to travel to Syria. It's not illegal to travel to Turkey. It's not even concerning in and of itself. Uh, there are many, many reasons why Americans might choose to travel to Syria. Um, traveling to Syria for the purpose of supporting the regime or the opposition is not in and of, in and of itself uh, illegal. There are many folks who travel for humanitarian pers uh, uh, purposes. So it's trying to identify those individuals who have violent intent uh, and spe who specifically intend to affiliate with terrorist groups, those are the folks of greatest concern to us. Um, and that is, quite frankly, uh, not easy. Um, in terms of the flows into the country, we're seeing the same things, Dick, that you are, of course, Turkey is a, a major kind of funnel of travel into Syria. Um, but it's, you know, Syria is, is far more accessible, we think, to Western extremists than maybe East Africa was in 2008 or Afghanistan and Iraq were uh, before that. Um, it's, you know, the prospect of travel across Europe is one that a lot of our young, impressionable, um, radicalized folks here in the States, that's a concept that's very easy for them to uh, kind of get their heads around and plan. Um, there's also, you know, many ways to, many routes that take you ultimately to Syria, and, uh, and many times we lose our visibility on those folks and what they're doing as they, you know, as they travel through, through Europe. So it's, it's a tough situation. One more question, uh, and this has to do with ideology and the narrative and radicalization. Each of you has spoken uh, about the role that Syria is playing in, uh, Dick, to use your, your language, rejuvenation of the radicalization process. Are there particular elements of what's happening in Syria that are changing or animating the ideology and narrative in a different way than the ways we've seen in the past? Is there something that makes this particularly uh, virulent or problematic uh, to the point of glorification of, of, of fighting. Is there something that's different in this context than what we've seen before? Because I think a, a core question I have, and I think others have as well, is, is the ideology itself changing? And is the narrative not only animating more radicalization, but is it changing over time because of what's happening in Syria? Andy, what, why don't we start with you? I think the ideology is similar to the extremist ide ideology that we've seen um, be so effective in recruiting young, radicalized, predominantly men um, in, in other theaters. For me, the biggest difference in Syria is the impact of communication facilities. So, you know, Syria is happening now in the age of social media, in the age of internet propaganda. 
and the ability for extremists, for radicalizers, for recruiters to reach directly out to those populations of greatest concern, uh, to kind of glorify with images uh, of the battle uh, what's happening there, or, or kind of uh, present it, of course, in the light most favorable to their, uh, to their aims. I don't think that's something that we experienced in Afghanistan or Iraq. I don't think it's something we experienced in Somalia. I think it's really the impact of, uh, of social media, the ease of communication from the, from the theater of battle right back here to the homeland. I would certainly agree with Andy. I think the other thing that I uh, find um, interesting is how professional it's become. Uh, these folks are, are, are really uh, good at what they do. They understand the market that they're operating in and they've designed uh, products that appeal uh, in a, you know, to Westerners as opposed to people, people living in the West. So it's the, the increased professionalism with which they've used social media, uh, advertisement, propaganda to reach the communities that they're trying to uh, reach out to. Dick, any thoughts? Yeah, but uh, both my colleagues are absolutely right in what they are saying. And, and uh, it's not about a change in ideology, uh, but social media and, and the brutality in which they uh, also, and, and professionalized, professionalized way, they uh, put themselves in uh, on social media is, is really amazing. Uh, and somehow it attracts. And then there are the numbers, um, at least from, from our point of view and, and a few other European countries as well, we've seen some uh, individual traveling to Pakistan and Afghanistan, but not had real contact with the, uh, uh, with the Netherlands and, and with the friends back. Now there are a lot of, uh, a lot of them are going over, have strong contact still. Um, so the whole aspect of this glorifying of the martyrdom of, in a context in which the, um, of this glorifying martyrdom is so very important. And uh, it's amazing that nobody says this is idiot. Uh, and that there is not a, uh, somebody saying this should not be done. I mean, we had a, a, a guy, um, in, his, his residential permit was taken away before, uh, lucky enough, but he went onto the internet with five chopped heads. I mean, this is really amazing. And, and I suppose we didn't see that before. Yeah. And it is being glorified um, and not being radicalized or. or uh, so that's, I think, one part. The other part is that uh, it, it is in the context of trying to say, on the other hand, that what they are doing is good, and that they are trying to get rid of the regime, and that they are trying to liberate uh, Syria, in which the Western world plays its own role. And, and they use that context somehow. So that's, that's fascinating as well. Yeah. And, and one thing we haven't talked about was the recent news reporting of the first American suicide bomber in, in theater, um, as reported by the media, uh, which is a demonstration of, of all of, of what's been described. Let's now open it up for, for questions. Again, uh, identify yourself, um, gentlemen in the back, and please ask a succinct question. We'll try to get as many as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, Munzer Sleiman with Al Mayadeen TV. To what extent this effort, preventing, preventing or preventive measures, goes against the announced policy in Syria. If, uh, and we heard the president speak yesterday about um, uh, supporting the moderate opposition, what time that it has been discovered that you should resort to measure to stop a terrorist or affiliated with Al-Qaeda to go from Western country. And there is any effort with regional countries who are sending terrorists, what kind of coordination is going on with those regional countries and what time, and to how much effective if the policy is to invite people to go to Syria to support the opposition, and what define moderate versus non-moderate in those groups. A couple of interesting questions there. Frank? I'm, I'm, no, I'm no longer in the State Department, so. <laughs> uh, it, it's an excellent question, and I think um, I would answer it in this way. And, um, 
First of all, it's a global issue requ requiring global diplomatic uh, cooperation, and certainly our European partners, Turkey, Tunisia, uh, Jordan, Morocco, have all been engaged in a dialogue around the issues of how do we uh, work together in countering the radicalization. Now, as Andy mentioned, it's not illegal to go to, uh, to Syria. And in certain cases, people go there for legitimate humanitarian reasons. The challenge is figuring out who goes there and for other purposes, for the purposes of terrorist acts, not only in the uh, terrorist acts back against the, uh, the homeland. Uh, so it is a very difficult problem. It is unlike problems we've faced in the past, but it takes international cooperation, which we are engaged in on a continuous basis, but also um, understanding uh, who, who may have been radicalized for the purposes of conducting terrorist actions back against uh, their home countries as opposed to people who may be there legitimately for humanitarian reasons and are doing uh, good work uh, that needs to be done to help uh, refugees and those sorts of things and trying to figure out who's who and you know, who we need to be worried about as opposed to not to be worried about. Uh, up here in front, this young lady. Julie McCree from JEMDIC. I, 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 I really appreciated listening to what you all had to say. Andy, you really hit home with me on what you were saying. But one question I have is that why is it that we focus on the end place, which is Syria, and we really are not looking at the intelligence that they're using? Re we, use we use these buzzwords, radicalization, but we have to understand that the network that terrorism creates begins from within. And here in our country, you know, they don't get to Syria alone. I mean, we're not looking at it linked. Look at Mexico and Central America and the drug trade that goes on and the drug wars. They're all linked together. Maybe we need to look at this more as a chain, as links to this, instead of focusing on hot spots, because all of these hot spots, just like the fires in California, leap, and they join together, and they all use social media. And the traditional ways in which we are approaching our intelligent ways, are, are, uh, they're beating us because we're not using, we're not looking within. You know, we look at the actions of Edward Snowden as an isolated action, but is it? Because the people who use social media are, many are economically sound, intellectually astute people. And in order to promote any form of terrorism, you need very bright people who are very capable to manipulate other minds who are not lesser minds, but are more likely to be manipulated. And we're not looking at it that way. We need to listen to their music, and we need to really follow social media from within. A excellent points and great question. I but just have to cut you off because I want to get to a couple more. Andy, can you address this and maybe Dick talk about sort of this idea of hot spots and networking? Yeah, sure. Absolutely agree with your comments about um, it's really a global jihad issue, right? So we're here obviously convened today to discuss Syria. So a lot, most of our comments are focused on the issues specifically surrounding Syria. But I can assure you that the FBI and our partners uh, at DHS and across the intelligence community particularly are focused on the impact of the most significant terror, terror actors around the globe. And and most important within that set is their impact here in the homeland. Um, we are, uh, I think, the days when we kind of, I know internally, the days when we chop things up regionally and, uh, you know, the, the Pakistan folks didn't talk to the Iraq folks, that kind of stuff, those days are over. And we take a very holistic uh, I'll, I'll reach back to my organized crime days in New York. We take an enterprise approach to the way we investigate these groups and their activities. So we're far more interested in the individuals who are 
recruiting and facilitating that travel because it gives us the opportunity to look into a network. But oftentimes we find ourselves forced to focus on an individual who poses a threat uh, or a threat of travel now. And, and so those are kind of the disruption activities that you see publicly, but I can assure you we're very focused on, on the network behind the activity. Maybe one small comment because I, uh, I agree with Andy. And, um, but the other thing that's happening is that, it, um, is, is that if you want to get upfront on the terrorist question, you have to uh, go to the radicalization process as well. Because the radicalization itself is not something that is organized from one organization whatsoever. Uh, that's much more difficult. You have to look into uh, also the psychological effects. Uh, you have to do a, a total different way of reaching out to individuals, try to understand what's happening in their minds, in their heads, uh, why they're radicalized, and then make the other steps along the chain and going to terrorism. That's, that's very, very hard work. Very I, would, I would also add, and your point's well taken, and I think we've learned a lot in the last 20 years about uh, the, the enterprise of terrorism and how people move from being normal, not, not that they're ab from being normal people to, to taking on uh, irrational acts. But many of the actions that begin that process are legal in our country. And it's a balancing act of privacy, civil liberties, and all the other things that make our country and our other partners, um, our democracy, so special. So the balancing act of <clears throat> ensuring that protected uh, uh, behavior is protected and not uh, intruded upon while you're still looking at the, uh, the phenomenon uh, that we all know. It's not just for terrorism, but how violent extremism starts and how it uh, manifests itself is really the challenge that we all face uh, going th through. I, I'm reminded uh, every day that the thing that's unique in our country is our constitution and the rights that we guarantee to our citizens, and that always has to be the first thing that we think about as we use the tools that our Congress has given us to uh, try to identify these folks and uh, to interdict uh, before something bad happens. Thank you. Um, Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Heisenbaugh from Reuters Washington Bureau. I had a couple of questions. Number one, for the American people, um, what can you tell us, if anything, about the uh, background of this person who killed himself in a suicide bombing, apparently, over the weekend in Syria? And uh, there's been reporting today that the guy's from Florida. It's my understanding, just as of a few minutes ago, that the U.S. clearly knows who he is and that um, uh, his family have been notified, although his name has not been released. What can you tell us about who he is, how he got there? Second question is, and this is both for the Americans and for Mr. Schoofs, uh, to what extent uh, have plots been discovered uh, coming back towards uh, uh, people's countries of origins uh, uh, perpetrated by uh, people who have been to Syria and then come back? Andy, maybe you can take the, one, the first one and Dick, maybe the second. I can take the first one. It's not going to be an answer that you like. Uh, I can't, uh, obviously it is an ongoing investigation, and so I can't confirm any details uh, about the individual or his background at this time. Dick? That was going to be my answer, too. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I was trying to protect you. <laughs> Dick, any, any uh, anecdotes or uh, plots that you can describe and answer a question to? Uh, and it goes for plots are two different things. I mean, uh, but I love the answer. Um, by the way, um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have the same experience. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the there have been some uh, official press releases uh, related to possible plots in Europe. In Europe, I said in Europe. Two more quick questions, please. This gentleman in the back. Good morning. My name is Bassam. I'm a former Syrian diplomat. I, actually, I want <clears throat> to answer your last questions. What the difference between ISIS and other ISIS we saw in Afghanistan or in Iraq? In ISIS, in Damascus or in Syria, 
basically what we do, we do mapping of the conflict. We do mapping for ISIS, where are they here in DC? ISIS is gaining land and getting territory in Syria. They're getting, they have now schools, they have hospitals, they declare winner, uh, they are moving to establish their own state, Islamic state. They are not losing, nobody is attacking them. In Raqqa, the, they are far away from the regime forces, one mile, and they are controlling all the water sources, all the oil sources, wheat sources, they have school, hospitals, the people pay bills. So that's what makes them different from the other experience in Iraq where they were under heavy attack or in Afghanistan. And that's what makes them asking other jihadists from all over the world to come because they are winner. Assad forces not attacking them. The other moderate forces are very weak and they, are, they have support from Iraq. Uh, basically, this is the most important thing what makes other people to go to join. They are not under attack. They are winning. They're getting a lot of resources. Thank you. Good. Let me maybe convert that into a quick question for the panel, which is, are you worried about the longevity of this conflict, the potential that you have safe haven, and the narrative of uh, ongoing victory and establishment of an actual state in the context of the foreign fighter flow? Dick? As, as I said uh, in my introduction, uh, the threat is going to be uh, uh, sustained. And one of the reasons is that uh, the, the conflict in Syria will uh, sustain for quite a while. And uh, the, the two major uh, uh, parties where we are concerned about, al-Nusra and ISIL, are more or less in combat. And uh, the, the, at least the European terrorist fighters are either in al-Nusra or in ISIL, so are also fighting each other. So that, that creates uh, an even more and more complex conflict that will stay for quite a long time. Yeah, absolutely, we're concerned about it. At the end of the day, the conflict drives the narrative, and the narrative drives the motivation to our HVEs, to terrorists abroad. It, it's, uh, and as the conflict shows no signs of resolution, the narrative goes on, and its impact gets deeper and deeper on the populations we're concerned about. One last question. Mr. Salufo in the back, please. Frank Salufo, and thank you for an excellent panel. Uh, the conversation here couldn't have been had two years ago, so kudos to, to all the good work. My question is primarily for Dick, but as it applies domestically to our homeland. And returnees, how are you addressing some of the returnees coming to the Netherlands, if you can give us a sense of numbers, and then specifically how we can integrate some of those efforts into our state and local efforts? Because Andy, I think you were spot on Ultimately, they're the first line, but they're also going to be the last line of defense in some point. So, Dick, any, anything you can do? And also from the narrative, you were saying we're not pushing back. What better than people who've been duped or people who are arrested to be part of that narrative to respond to those who may be uh, inclined to go in that direction? Uh, if, if you allow me. Um, uh, when somebody returns, um, what, what we don't do uh, is uh, administrative detention. Uh, it's, it's, and in some European countries, it's in debate whether you should return immediately put in administrative detention um, and so the police and the intelligence service can question them and maybe you can build up your prosecution case to, uh, to court. We don't do. Unless we have, uh, but that's not administrative detention, we have enough evidence that the prosecution can immediately uh, 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 act. What we do is, uh, when an individual returns, we make a, 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 a multi-team of local authority, national authorities, police, uh, intelligence, youth, school, whatsoever, and uh, trying to uh, assess what the risk of this individual is, and on basis on that assessment, making sure what we can do. And as I said before, sometimes it will be very impressive and he will be under 24-7 surveillance from either intelligence or police or law enforcement. Uh, but on the other hand, it could be as well uh, the, uh, to make sure that he get a job uh, and, and get his life on, uh, and, and only a, a slow monitoring on it. And then I think that's, that's very important because you, you, it has to be individual. And lucky enough with the numbers, we still can. I mean, when it becomes thousands, it becomes much more problematic in the Netherlands, uh, but 125, 150, we can still manage, I suppose. Andy, do you want to comment? Sure. Uh, uh, as Dick mentioned, it's an entirely kind of each individual is very different. 
um, as people uh, return from Syria, if we have information that leads to the predication of an, of an initial investigation, which we refer to as an assessment, we'll certainly do that to try to get a sense of whether or not this individual actually poses a threat or has violated the criminal laws of the United States. That is very tough to do. I certainly cannot tell you that we'll maintain a particular level of surveillance or coverage or investigation on any, um, any number of folks. We're very well aware of the fact that as the, con as the conflict continues and those numbers continue to grow, that will uh, you know, quickly outstrip our, our abilities to aggressively uh, investigate. You know, there's, only so many, you know, there's only so many resources that we have. Um, but nevertheless, uh, individuals who, when we have information that they have affiliated with terrorist organizations and engaged in terrorist activities overseas, we will investigate and pursue those individuals and ensure that they face justice for that activity. Uh, those are crimes here in the United States, even if you've done it overseas, and we'll take full advantage of all of our investigative tools. Uh, to affect those results. But, you know, those are rare cases, and there are going to be many folks who come back who, quite frankly, our uh, investigative options are limited um, uh, in terms of what we can do uh, with those individuals. Yeah, well, uh, um, I, I asked the chair if I could make one last remark about international cooperation, uh, because that's important as well. And, we, and, we did, and I put a lot of stress on local and individual. Um, but international cooperation is also key. Of course, within the European Union, um, uh, and we work quite a lot, and also together with the European uh, Terrorism Coordinator, Shilde Kerkhoven. Uh, but what is also very important for us is the, uh, the work we are doing um, within the Global Counterterrorist Forum, which is headed by the United States and Turkey. And within that, in the, in the work, so-called work stream, violent extremism, uh, we have a Moroccan-Dutch initiative on the foreign terrorist fighters, which really is trying to grasp uh, the, uh, the, the more, I think you and you mentioned, holistic view in which we can uh, work together and trying to, to get this problem really at our hands. And what's very important is that Turkey and Moroccan are so involved. Um, and, and we had, uh, for two weeks ago, we had a, a meeting with some ministers in the European Union of countries which are really involved in this question. And I did accompany the Minister of uh, Security and Justice of the Netherlands. And there were also, DHS was, uh, was there at the level of Deputy Secretary. Tunisia was there, Morocco was there, uh, the, uh, Turkey, Jordan. So we it, it really have to work very closely together and see what we can do. And that's what, just what, another point I would like to make. Well, wonderful. I think we could go on for hours. The fortunate thing is we've got another hour of the conference led by uh, Dr. John Alterman, our Brzezinski chair here at CSIS. Uh, we reached deep into stoppage time, so apologies to the next panel, but uh, the, the lifting of the wall served us well, I think. Uh, Help me to thank uh, the panelists, thank the Dutch Embassy and DHS for their sponsorship, and uh, please help me uh, thank the panelists.